Hello and welcome to the demonstration of the Plaxus LE3D Stability Modeling Package. My name is Murray Fredland and I'll be leading you through an overview of the high-level 3D abilities of the software today. So when the software first opens, the user is presented with a list of distribution models that come with the software. And there are approximately 750 distribution models on a variety of different application areas. So today we're focusing on 3D slope stability applications and the distribution models for such applications are found under a project uh, titled Slopes 3D. So our primary interest will be related to opening and examining how some typical models are set up with the software since this is a demonstration and not a tutorial. So I could scroll down in this menu uh, or in this list until I hit the Slopes 3D project and examine the models that way, but there is also a simpler way. I can select the filter button and deselect all the projects that I want to display and then go down and select the Slopes 3D project, select that and then click OK. And this way only the models that are under that particular project display on the list. Now that I have the 3D slope stability models selected, I can scroll through them and when I click on a particular model file, a thumbnail of that model is displayed along with the model description. I can see when the model was last executed, how long it took to run as well. I can also use the favorites column to select a model to find it easily later. So today I'm going to start with a simple tailings dam model in order to illustrate the basic concepts of how the software functions. So here we have the tailings dam model open and uh, firstly it might be good to talk about what are the differences between a 2D and a 3D model. I mean most of you are familiar with a two-dimensional model. Really what you have is differences in the model settings, in the definition of geometry, in how we define searching for a critical slip surface. We have differences in how the pore water pressures are defined and loading is defined slightly different and how you define your supports is slightly different. So let's just quickly go through what those mean. In terms of your model settings, it's located in the same place in the menu. However, now the big difference is that you have to define direction of your, of your sliding mass. And it can either be easily towards the positive X or negative X or in any orientation. And this problem is set up currently so that it slides conveniently towards positive X. In most real world situations, you would select multiple orientations because it's not uh, typical that your sliding direction would exactly follow one particular coordinate axis and the software can handle that. Uh, you will also need to specify your resolution of your columns. Uh, in 2D, you specify the number of slices. In 3D, you have to specify the number of rows and slices. And the default model starts out at about 50 each direction. You'll likely have to increase that a little bit to get the resolution you need so that the factor of safety doesn't change when you change the column resolution. So next, the geometry menu defines how you set up your problem geometry. And there are a few different ways to do this, but most typical models such as this follow a, somewhat of a la layered cake type of definition in which now you have regions which are defined in plan view and then you have uh, surfaces that define the elevations of different layers. So here for example this model we have six different surfaces used to define the model and you can see if you click through them they're selected on the screen. And each of these surfaces is a 15 by 6 grid. They don't have to be grids, they can be meshes to make a more detailed surface and or they can just be planes. So planes, grids, or surface meshes are used to set up a model. You can also use as an advanced feature fully in, encapsulated volume meshes. So the other difference is the slip surface searching. You specify your searching method in your model settings and here we're searching with the grid and tangent method. There's a few different other somewhat manual methods such as entry and exit or more automated methods such as slope search or cuckoo search. And these can be set up and they define, once you define your search method, then your, uh, what displays in your slips 
menu system changes so that you are defining the parameters for executing on that search. So here we're talking about grid and tangent. You would have to set up your grid of centers and then your tangent planes. And tangent planes are horizontal in three-dimensional uh, analysis. And then you also have to define your aspect ratios that you're going to search for. So here is your grid of centers, three different points, and you can define them by typing in coordinates or drawing them graphically on the screen. So here you have a pore water pressure water surface that can be defined using a grid or a mesh or an elevation. And the same options as two-dimensional analysis are available here. So really just all that changes is your definition of your water surface and how you're defining it geometrically in three dimensions. Loadings, point loads are applied in 3D space. Distributed loads may be applied to any particular region in the model. And so those change slightly. If you want to apply a distributed load, you have to first define a region to apply it to and then place the distributed load of that magnitude against that region on the surface. Supports are defined in 3D as well. And you define your type and the physics of the support in the same manner as 2D but the geometry is defined fully in three dimensions and there's, there's methods in the software for now entering groups of anchors in a certain pattern. So now that we know the difference with 3D modeling, we can look at this model that is largely an extruded model. It's a fairly simple, straightforward 3D model. A little bit of variation in the third direction and grid and tangent searching. And we can see how it's set up. We can analyze this and look at the results by going to the back end. And we can plot the material and get an idea of what the results look like. This is the critical slip surface that is showing right here in the columns shown on the ground surface. The color of every column represents the material that is sheared through at the base of that column. So you can quickly get a, um, a visual idea of which materials are being sheared through by the critical slip surface. So this is very useful to see. We can see the grid of centers, the computed factor of safety. You can do things like extrude the sliding mass out of the slope, having a good, have a good look at it, what it looks like, the shape of it, get an idea of that. We'll put it back in the slope for the time being, just to do some further examination. So now we would like to take this model and and drill down on the slip surface to see and understand what this analysis is telling us. If we look at the individual columns, we can see that the color of the column represents the material that is sheared through at the base of the column. And so that tells us a lot about which, in, which materials are providing shear resistance to movement in this model. So we can get a better idea for the shape of the slip surface if we wanted to look at that by exploding it out of the slope a little bit and examining it further in 3D by rotating it around. So this is an ellipsoidal slip surface. You get an idea for the location and the mass of it. We're gonna put that back in the slope and then look at some other data. So for example, we might wanna look at it in plan view and get an idea for the lateral extents of the slip. And if we click on any particular column, we can see the related information for that column in the legend to the side. Likewise, we can do that in looking at the side profile view of the slip. We can adjust which location we are examining. We can also go into the software and select to show trial slip surfaces, say all of them. And that, gets, that shows all the slip surfaces, but it's quite an involved view. So we might want to pare that down to maybe the 30 most critical ones. And we can see those. Have a look at them from the front view or from the top view. So we get an idea of which trial slip surfaces were utilized in to find the critical slip surface. So in this case, we're going to go back. We're going to turn off all trial slip surfaces, just show the critical one. You can also go in here and show the lambda graph and show the convergence of the method and confirm that both force and moment are being solved properly in this case. You can also go in the software and plot across the slip surface 
what variable is plotted on the top of every column. Here we're plotting the material that is sheared through at the base. However, it might be very interesting to see the shear resistance. And so here what we're plotting is the shear resistance at the base. And so what's interesting here is you can see which columns are providing the most resistance to movement out of this entire 3D sliding mass. So this gives a very good perspective of where the resistance is coming. There's also reporting tools to put out um, typical values, the volume and the total activating forces, details such as that in the software as well. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of the reporting tools in the back end of the software in terms of visualization of your results and allowing the engineer to get a comfort with how the factor of safety is calculated in the software. I like this example of a 3D model because it illustrates an interesting point about topology. This is a model that would be very difficult to analyze in 2D because you don't know where to pick the critical sliding direction. You don't know if it should be off the nose or down either sides. What's the, what's the most critical spatial location that you should analyze the slip surface for. And so it's a great example in 3D. I mean, we can take and, and pick in the software, in this example, a critical sliding direction and try a few different angles as shown by these arrows. And what we see is in this location, we get a critical slip surface. If we go to the back end and display the results, here is our resulting critical uh, slip surface. And it picked one of the angles just to the right or uh, the left if you're facing down the slope and you can see the critical location of the the sliding mass and so ideally you would use a multi-plane analysis to sweep the analysis around this slope and so that you get an idea are you sure of spatially where this analysis should be So in this example now we have engaged the multiplane analysis and we are doing many analyses around the slope, not just one at one location. All of these analyses are three dimensional in nature. And so when we do this method of analysis, we get a much better idea of where the critical slip lo location might be. And we can see in this case that it stabilizes on this side of the slope and it does so because this, the slope on this side of the slope is a little steeper than on the right hand side. And so therefore it shifts the most critical location a little bit to the left in this example. We can further extend this analysis by putting in anchors in the most critical location of failure and try to see if we can increase the factor of safety of this region. So here we have added anchors of an irregular pattern to the most critical location and we've performed the same multi-plane analysis and swept the analysis at different spatial locations around the slope. The end result is that the critical slip location shifts from around this area to the left of the nose to the right of the nose. This is as a result of putting in the anchors and allowing the critical location to shift naturally to the right and we see that the factor of safety has increased slightly as well. This analysis represents a back analysis of the Big Sur landslide in California. We can see what we've done is recreated the topography from publicly available data and we have matched a slip surface approximately to the location of the slide where it occurred and then backed out the the material properties to get a factor of safety equal to 1.0. And we can drape, of course, a, an aerial photo across the model here, so we get a very nice visual impact of the model. And if we go to the back end, we can see the calculation of the critical slip surface or the defined slip surface as it stands in the software. So here we see the columns of the critical slip surface that fairly closely match the actual slide that occurred and you can have a look at what this looks like. You can take this and extrude this out of the slope if need be to have a look at the critical sliding mass. 
So therefore the tool is quite useful as a back analysis tool and can be used as such to uh, quickly perform back analysis and match the 3D shape which is the important part of some of these more complex three-dimensional slides. Another potentially very interesting application of the software and, and of the multiplane analysis is the analysis of riverbanks and the stability issues that are often occurring next to riverbanks. In particular, this shows uh, the evaluation of a riverbank next in a, in a city and next to an eroding riverfront that is progressing over time. And so, what we have done is spread a multiplane analysis across this model. We've we've overlain a aerial photograph to get an idea of where the structures are related to the water and we can analyze this model and get an idea of where the critical zones of safety are and we can also do a back analysis if there are existing slope failures that have occurred already we can match those results in the model and then use that back analysis to do further forward analysis studies along the riverbank. This is an interesting example analysis of a spatial slope stability analysis of an open pit in which we have varying topography and we, we don't know specifically where the minimum critical slip surface will be. So what we're doing is we're solving it with trial and error and sweeping uh, multi-plane analysis around the outside of the open pit structure. We're also sweeping the analysis up the downslope next to the structure as well. So every location here, when we implement an MPA search, it searches for three different sliding directions and picks the most critical one. And the idea of this is that we will get an idea of the spatially varying factors of safety around this large structure. So if we go to the results and bring those up, we can just contour the colors of the factor of safety a little more distinctly. And what we can see here is that many of the factors of safety are a little above 1.2. Then we have two different zones where we're right around 1.0. One zone is right here. The other zone is up on this face, this wall. 0.988 so you can see which zones are spatially the weakest and even though the searching lines it should be uh, kept in mind so it should be considered that each of the searching lines are searched the entirety of the slip direction line and the critical slip location may change in size depending on the trial slip surfaces so each of these individual 2d sliding planes represents a comprehensive 2D analysis in its own right. And next, what is possible to do in the software is take the multi-plane analysis concept and extend it to three-dimensional analysis. So now at every one of these profiles, a full three-dimensional analysis is done with ellipsoids. And you can consider other things like faults and weak zones and everything like that, but this model just has a single fault entered in it and that's the only one being considered right now. So if we flip to the results, we can look at the resulting contours of factor of safety around this complex structure. And we're gonna change the contours to be a little more intuitive. And what you can see here is the same 3D structure, same material properties as in the 2D analysis. And if you remember back from there, this zone was of concern. We can see a higher factor of safety now, closer to 1.5 because of the three-dimensional lateral effects that were present in the topography. And so this one went up about 30 to 50% in this zone. In this zone, we only see increases of about 11%. So this zone is much more critical in light of the 3D analysis and should be considered slightly differently than the area over here. And so it's very interesting how the three-dimensional analysis will pull out different and, and more interesting aspects of the analysis and then it considers topography 
in a more comprehensive fashion. Lastly, we can see with this example that there is more surface detail captured as we are using a mesh surface. So the individual benches are captured of this open pit and what we are doing is we are sweeping a multiplane analysis around this at many different locations around this structure and we're able to analyze it comprehensively in, in a, a short amount of time. So the model set up in this case is just homogeneous. You could add more complex structures and faults and weak surfaces if you needed to. If we look at the results, what we will see once it comes up here is the location of the critical slip location and the relative factor of safety around the different zones of this complex complex structure. So this is very helpful in ga gauging the relative stability of different zones of this structure and what's nice about the software is if you get into rock stability we can account for this the constitutive models of rock mechanics anisotropy and bedding planes can all be accounted for in the model and it gives quite a nice tool for giving a spatially representative idea of stability around a, a fairly complex structure. In this model we can also take the slip surface, the critical sliding mass, extrude it out of the slope and get an idea for the shape of the critical sliding mass here and what it looks like. This is an open pit model where we have a little more complexity added to it now. So we're looking at two particular items that have been added to this, this model. If we look here, we can see the effect of material volume meshes in these 3D zones that uh, stick up above the ground. It's okay, it's just a visual reference above the ground. They are not, the areas above the ground surface are not considered in the slope stability analysis but show the original location of these these geologic formations. And then the second effect is the bedding planes which is represented by these these translucent surfaces and they again come above the ground because that area has been excavated by the open pit operation and is not considered but the zone under the ground is still considered in the anisotropic part of the analysis and these bedding planes serve to define what is the orientation of the weak layer below the ground for the purposes of the weak anisotropic layer. So if we go to the back end and look at the results, what we're going to do to clean things up, we've, we've run a multi-plane analysis around this entire structure. We're going to turn off some of the effects. Let's turn off material volume meshes, display just so we can see a little clearer what's happening. Let's turn off bedding planes and just not display them. And now uh, let's shut off some of the legends to clean up the display. You can see where we've defined the anisotropic linear model number two in this numerical model. And we can see the zones where the factor safety is drops a little bit lower. And then the critical sliding mass is right here. And let's have a look at this. Let's just extrude this out of the slope so we can have a more crucial look at it. And what we can see here is it started with an ellipsoidal shape is what's interesting. And then it found a anisotropic layer that was a little weaker and it gets a lower factor safety by following this anisotropic layer. Therefore, we can see this even on the slope, on the um, sliding mass itself, where it's ellipsoidal, except where it follows the anisotropic defined layer there. And so you can have these hybrid 3D shapes of your slip surface that successfully follow anisotropy and consider very complex 3D geological conditions in the model. So thank you very much for your time. This concludes the demo of Plaxus LE3D. Please contact our sales team for additional information.